Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, people on Zoom, if you're not able to hear, let us know uh, as soon as possible. We'll to figure out dates. Uh, my name is Rahul. I work here at the Center for Policy Research. Thank you again for joining us today. This is the fourth in the seat of 20 conversations in the run up to 2024 elections. And today we are basically going to discuss about the nature of India, India's welfare state, welfare politics, whether India is still in terms democracy or not. And to have this conversation, we are delighted to have Professor Rahul Mukherjee, Professor and Head of the Department of Political Science at Heidelberg University in Germany. Uh, Professor Mukherjee is also an element of Center for Policy Research, so it's a privilege to be here. Uh, Rahul Mukherjee has been writing on uh, political economy of reforms. Uh, he has two books and one short Oxford introduction. Uh, a book which is a short introduction to the series uh, 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 brought out by uh, Oxford University Press. Uh, the name of that short introduction is on your reforms in India. Uh, this first book was in the transition, the politics of reforms, and the second book, globalization and deregulation ideas, interest, and institutional changes in India. The reason uh, I requested Professor Mukherjee is here today, one, because he was in Delhi. Uh, on the nature of welfare delivery in many uh, Indian states, in Andhra Pradesh and West Bengal. So I thought he would be able to add uh, to conversations on welfare state at, uh, at the provincial uh, level in that sense. Uh, the other person is uh, Yamini Ayer, uh, whom you have met uh, uh, many times. Uh, 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 Yamini is president and CEO of Center for Policy Research. She has been writing on issues related to governance, on federalism, on the nature of welfare state. So welcome, uh, Rahul, uh, for today's conversation. And to do today uh, is I to have a more conversation with uh, the two panelists, and I'll request them to be brief in their response. People who are on Zoom, I would request you to put your questions on Q&A box, and they would reach me. Uh, via WhatsApp, and I'll try to basically bring in those questions as well as questions from this room uh, after 30 minutes. So, uh, you know, the, uh, in last couple of years, at least the question of welfare has been deeply politicized. Uh, and if you look at the debates that are taking place uh, between political parties, one party announces certain programs and policies in the run up to elections and they call it welfare, trying to take care of people. And the other party basically calls it a freebies or AB. And this happens in almost every state. Basically, the nature of wealth, like conversation on welfare state is getting in some ways uh, polarized. India was long and uh, in, in some scholarly formulation, India has been described as a patronage democracy, where these welfare elements are used by political parties and politics to basically just get uh, But I would like to bring in Rahul on and, and just to start this conversation. Uh, using the scholarly and theoretical framework, what do you think about India's welfare? Whether India's patronage democracy, so much on political economy of reforms, how has the nature of welfare state in India changed post-liberalization and where we are heading? Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you very much for the warm welcome because CPR is indeed the first institution that employed me when I came back uh, as a freshly minted PhD from the United States of America. And I must say that that was a very big break in my life because in those days, I don't think I was very employable, even though I was highly qualified. <laughs> and and uh, so to be getting back here after so many years, and this indeed actually is the first formal uh, engagement that I have. I have visited CPR <clears throat> when Professor Pratap Bhanu Mehta was the president. So it's indeed both nostalgic as well as uh, a matter of uh, great privilege for me to 
be back here. Uh, I would say the following regarding patronage democracy and clientelism. Indeed, I was very, very deeply engaged with the aspect of welfare, especially because having studied the political economy of globalization, it struck me that globalization is very, very inequitous. On the other hand, <clears throat> the problem was that while on the, on the one hand, uh, quite a bit of resources and political commitment were offered in the direction of welfare to the state after a certain period of time, uh, it was also clear that aspects of India patronage democracy life at that time. So following that kind of inclination and motivation, I went to study like your president, and I was deeply influenced by the piece that she wrote in India Review, the success of Andhra Pradesh. <clears throat> and I must say that we had a deep engagement. We published two or three papers uh, and covered through this engagement, as well as another engagement with the state of West Bengal, that <clears throat> one of the things that produces state capacity uh, which counterintuitively is not highlighted in the literature in comparative politics and comparative political economy is actually the importance of a policy paradigm. Uh, you know, political scientists have largely become materialists. I now find that Dr. Verma has started talking about ideas. So along with his, uh, you know, uh, famous mentor, uh, but in those days, uh, very few people were talking about ideas. And in that quest to understand transcending clientelism, we found that a policy paradigm is actually a combination of both bureaucratic intent and capacity, as well as political will to support that intent. I, I can belabor this point later on, but just to briefly mention here that in our comparative work, one of, for example, there's a paper in studies in Indian politics, there's another paper in Indian politics and policy. We haven't brought the two papers together. That would be actually a bigger contribution. <clears throat> we found that you may have a very capable and welfare-oriented bureaucracy, but if the political masters don't will it, uh, bureaucrats cannot achieve much. We found through a periodization of conservation history also that the same Department of Rural Development, which had developed capacities over time, would not be able to do the same things under different chief ministers. Uh, that is not to say that the capacity of the bureauc bureaucracy to, to actually deliver was not being imposed, right? Uh, so, for, for example, I would argue that in the case of Andhra Pradesh, uh, there was a kind of tipping point when uh, Chief Minister Rajshekar Reddy met a bunch of bureaucrats, and I think these were interactions that produced a policy, a policy paradigm which, uh, on the one hand, promoted investments, but on the other hand, was deeply redistributed. And the redistributive capacity uh, which evolved as a policy paradigm with, with substantial instruments, actually could take on a very powerful lobby of farmers in Andhra Pradesh. On the other hand, in West Bengal, uh, where you would intuitively think that the Communist Party of India Marxist is a left-oriented party, uh, we argue in the other paper that they had actually turned neoliberal. And in fact, the, the redistributive people within the party had been marginalized and the bureaucracy was very frustrated. And so counterintuitively we found that in, so actually we, <clears throat> what we, what we actually found was that you have to look at both of these uh, factors very carefully to see how uh, policy paradigm evolves and becomes powerful. Now, I would just want to mention one thing because this is not, this is an area where uh, 
Yamini is the expert and she knows much more than me about what's happening in current times. But I would say that there were, for example, Bihar is a much poorer state and did not implement. West Bengal was poorer than Andhra Pradesh could not succeed. So you can see varying levels of capacity, right? Which has nothing to do with uh, the need of the people on the ground to get welfare. However, transcending clientelism, in my view, at that point in time, was not a party-driven strategy. It was failure or success to a lesser or greater extent in transcending clientelism. So in Andhra Pradesh, backward caste groups and Dalits came together to work in a place to get their daily wages. But they were not mobilized to vote for a particular party. The same could be said for now. It's true that Andhra Pradesh succeeded to a greater extent than West Bengal. But what we are beginning to see, and I think the more exciting current research, uh, is where I would, I think, uh, I hope that Yamini will give us. Thank you, Rahul. Uh, Yamini, you may also need this mic. But let me basically pick two questions questions from uh, Rahul's formulation. One is uh, this idea of politics of redistribution. It comes from, correct me if I'm wrong, it comes from the uh, uh, European country, right? You first need some kind of resources to be able to redistribute. And the second point which uh, Rahul uh, mentioned is about the ability of the governments or the capacity of the government to deliver those things. And so you see one kind of welfare state in India developing if we think at the provincial level in perhaps uh, in Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh and a very different kind of welfare state uh, developing in Bengal, right? Like the capacity of states to, uh, I think both the capacity as well as resources matter. So in the context of like, uh, sort of a like comparatively, where do you see India's welfare state? And let's not just focus on the current moment because that would be in the second round. But over last 30 years, comparatively, how India's uh, welfare state developed, what kind of impulses were there for politics of redistribution, uh, and what were the differences at the federal level? Thank you. Thanks, Rahul. It's a uh, pleasure to be here. This series has... Uh is one of our sources of great pride at CPR. And so uh, I'm really excited to, to be here as a speaker um, and a pontificator. Uh, so thank you for inviting me. And it's a real privilege to have Rahul here because not only has he had a long association with CPR, but um, I think I when I came to CPR, some of your Andhra Pradesh papers were coming out just around that time, late 2000s, if I'm not wrong. Um, and uh, as, so, so as, as I was honing some of my early ideas on how to think about questions of governance, capacity, accountability, I read a lot of your work and uh, it, it most definitely contributed a lot into uh, my own thinking. Um, so, so it's a real privilege to be in conversation with you. Rahul, I think, um, look, the, the tension between resources and redistribution uh, is has been baked in actually to our founding moment, right? So if you look at the big question of what kinds, what, what was our imagination of citizenship? How did we imagine the role of the state? Is are we core welfare? The whole debate on what should and should not be in the directive principles versus fundamental rights. Um, one over, I mean, uh, underlying all of that, the question of whether we had the resources to be able to commit to a certain kind of social welfare um, and social citizenship is the way I would put it. Uh, and what role would politics play in that was center stage. And I think in the choice of placing core fundamental social rights, uh, social and economic rights within the directive principles, the assumption also was that politics would over time with maturity create the appropriate checks and balances for um, uh, the, the Indian state to necessarily respond to the urgency of providing welfare. And in some ways it did, and, and it sort of feeds into this larger question of patronage, clientelism, terms that I have no, not always been completely comfortable with, but they are ways in which 
we have tried to understand and unpack the complexity of our political landscape. Um, but I, I think there was one very unique feature of the evolution of the welfare state in India, which is distinct from the evolution of the welfare state anywhere else in the Western world in particular, uh, which is where the imagination in some ways consolidated and cohered. Uh, our colleague Nilanjan Sirkar uh, constantly reminds us of this, that in some ways, uh, you know, the, the idea of welfare and the role of the, uh, uh, the state in providing these kinds of protections emerges in the Western world out of the process of industrialization. Whereas in the Indian context, in a, in a, you know, where we have always had, and in, a, in the 1950s, even much smaller formal economy, um, while we built in a certain set of core labor protections and other forms of social, social insurance and other forms of protection for, for the formal worker, the bulk of India has always been outside of that ambit. So really the question, the base on which the welfare state discourse has evolved in India and its relationship with politics, even though the labor union played a central role in the political imagination and the political economy, particularly of the 60s, 70s, and even till today, all our discourses on factor market reforms very much come back to those fundamental questions of the nature of our regulation and social insurance of, of uh, within the formal economy and the role of the unions in that. Really, the, 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 the emphasis on welfare was very much about the question of state obligation in the context of deep socioeconomic inequality, uh, questions of redistribution, and how you actually are, to, how citizenship Create spaces for articulation of socioeconomic rights and and bills claim make uh, citizens with uh, that that are able to rightfully place claims on the state, and I think here uh, we see while the constitution chose to place uh, our socioeconomic rights within our directive principles and particularly in the first few decades post independence, investments in the welfare state were limited, partly on account of lack of resources. You already saw evolution of politics creating the necessary um, uh, pressures uh, to start the process of experimentation of a unique welfare state that I think is India's. You see this in parts of India, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, uh, really important examples where politics created the spaces, prized open the spaces for very important uh, innovation around the nature of welfare framed within this uh, uh, articulation of a politics of social justice, dignity, and rights. And many of those early experimentations, the midday meal being the grandest example of all, eventually make their way into a larger national imagination of a universalist welfare. Uh, and, and I'm using the word universalist importantly because it comes into uh, tension with the way in which politics uh, uh, unfolds in its in its everyday uh, uh, realities of power and this whole question of patronage um, and and uh, and clientelism. Overall, however, in an environment of limited resources, we saw low levels of investment in welfare in terms of resources itself. It's not that the Indian state didn't aspire to. Uh, Investing in health and education, the Bhore Committee, which was founded in 1942, uh, had an imagination of universal health for India. Today, we are still talking about universal health care and a GDP expenditure with a GDP expenditure of 6% when we actually spend less than uh, just short of uh, one point uh, short of 2%. So the Kothari Commission set up in the 1960s, also with an imagination of universalizing education. It's not like these imaginations did not already find root in public discourse, but the absence of resources uh, and the nature of politics did not bring it into center stage. And in that in that story, the atrophying of the, the we had all, we had never actually made investments in the local state. And that is why, weak state capacity combined with a politics that didn't put welfare on the center stage created the perfect conditions for the Mai Bap Sarkar. The Indian state has always had this tension between at one level be, being expected constitutionally to be this agent of social change and therefore had to be autonomous and distinct and, uh, and separated from much of uh, society. And at the same time, its tentacles always operated in very embedded relationships with um, the, the local dynamics of power structure, and that is how you created the classic context in which patronage could be dispensed. So the Raghdar Bari story that most of us have grown up reading 
was very real and in some ways it continues to play out into much of our imagination and reality of how the state uh, functions and that was in the very very early stages of trying to build a welfare state i think the really big transformative moment comes through social movements in the 1990s combined with the consequences uh, of economic liberalization and therefore you know, and, and subsequently economic growth which both made it much harder in a democratic context for the state to hide behind absence of resources as the reason why it was not investing in core welfare, core public goods and welfare came together actually to create this. Um, and at the same time, the fact that the nature of growth, which politicians instinctively understood, even if they didn't want to articulate uh, effectively in the how they thought about their politics, uh, which was essentially a service oriented plus a trickle down consumption growth that didn't generate jobs. So, so as a consequence, you also have this growing inform and vulnerability in the Indian economy, which is a vulnerability caused out of, I guess, at some level, a good thing. You, as the economy starts growing, you begin to see movement out of agriculture. So the fundamental 101 or structural transformation, people are moving, except they are moving into more and more informal kind of construction type of jobs because the nature of our growth isn't uh, being able to create the kind of jobs that would give you the kind of social security um, that... Um, that many other co contexts which went through those structural transformations offered. And so the pressures on government to deliver now a little bit more seriously on welfare as a consequence of this, of this kind of growth were felt palpably, combined with the very visible uh, and, and important presence of social movements that pushed very hard on this idea that patronage politics was enabled by virtue of limited resources, a broken and deeply embedded state that delivered my BAP, uh, which, which was within a framework of my BAP, where constitutionally citizens didn't have socioeconomic rights to place claims on the state. And therefore, there was a need to move the imagination uh, and push a more for a more fuller articulation of citizenship within this framework of rights and seek universal welfare uh, for all. And it was in that framework that we see the big expansion of the welfare state in the early 2000s. One of the challenges that I think that had is that it was extremely centralized. It was at the national level and didn't account for the diversity and complexity and, and build it up. But I know that we'll talk about that at a later stage. But I think that's the framing in which the, the attempt always was to move away from patronage or from these imaginations about these these uh, categories that we've created of patronage and clientelism towards universalism and, and that's where the tension between redistribution politics um uh, and welfare state has stayed thank you Yanni, for you know uh, five capsules from the welfare state from independence till early 2000 uh, that was very very helpful now uh uh professor mukherjee i think like the last few uh, minutes of Yamini's uh, uh, sort of like talk gave me two questions. One, in the 90s, uh, when economic liberalization begins, in some senses, state is retreating from one sector, which is largely uh, uh, to do with the big industrial policies and other things. But in the second uh, segment, which might be because due to the pressures of social movement and top uh, bottom up sort of like upsurge, the state is also trying to become much more fair in orientation. So state is like, if you remember uh, Sunil Khilani's famous line that state basically penetrates all segments of the society, uh, which happens largely in 1970s, 1980s, right? So this nature of welfare state is also helping the state to create its tentacles as Yamini was uh, uh, mentioning. Uh, and the second point she said about the structural transformation, so India basically from an agrarian economy is largely moving towards the service sector economy without moving to the secondary segment of industrialization and other things which would have given more formal ways of employment. Uh, and so we never got the kind of social security framework uh, in our context compared to the uh, Western world. So the question uh, is following. now. In the 2000s, when we started getting this kind of centralized welfare states, one, is it just about the resources that the uh, 
like Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu kind of states are moving in one direction and UP and Bihar are moving in another direction? Or is it also some kind of political pressures, right? Uh, uh, and, and this is what confuses me because you have social justice parties uh, in, in, in Bihar also sort of like coming up with Tamil uh, Nadu. Uh, so what is actually the distinguishing features of the centralized welfare state which is developing in 2000, 2000s which has inbuilt some kind of right discourse and the reason uh, uh, some tentative answers are important for the early 2000s period because then it feeds in what's happening in the last few uh, years. Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, <clears throat> my answer is somewhat more variant than uh, uh, social, I mean, I, I, I mean, don't misunderstand me. I think civil society is very important. I think in what I'm going to write in the future, I will say that civil society is very important for promoting democracy. But uh, when I look at the empirical material that I have seen, and of course, I, uh, you know, I have not done the, the definitive study in this area. So I should say that with a lot of humility. <laughs> Uh, what I think has happened is that there is a certain ideation which is taking place at the central level. Now, of course, Yamini is right. There are social movements, there are pressures, but I think ideation is also very important. So, for example, uh, you know, one of our former colleagues who was with us here when Sri and I were working this session. Professor Arjun Sen, he, you know, look at the reports of the government of India. I mean, if you look at the reports of the government of India in the early to mid-1980s, they are about why import substitution has failed. There is Abed Hussain, there is Narasim Ham, there is even Arjun Sen has a very critical report on that. So, and, you know, look at uh, I.G. Patel himself. Uh, I mean, he delivers this, I think, Kingsley Martin lecture at, uh, at at Cambridge University, where, you know, he was literally the drafter of the second five-year plan. Uh, if you read his biography, you'll find that. And he's saying that, you know, we, the drafters, did not understand that we'll become a rent-seeking rent. Because if you really look at the statistics, you will find that not until the mid-1980s, was uh, the absolute numbers of poor people in India declined. I mean, this is like, you know, Nehru has had a socialist phase. Mrs. Gandhi has had a very credible socialist phase. Until the early to mid-1970s, even the proportion of Indians below the poverty line was not declining. Hmm. Uh, and I would say that India had in the past been blessed with very smart economists who were serving the government. And they came to this conclusion that import substitution, as they had understood it, was neither delivering growth. And this was all in the context of a rising China. It was in the context of the rising South Asian tigers. And therefore, you find that in response to the reports from 1978 to about uh, 1985, you have a plethora of deregulatory reforms that take place in the 1980s. So when in 1991, you get the so-called I've argued in my book that it's like a tipping point and I can belabor why it's a tipping point. For other people. But there's a huge amount of ideation that happens. And that ideation is central because India gets what we now famously call heterodox reforms. 99% of the countries that IMF actually just completely sink. The IMF is like a doctor that gives the pill that actually it's worse than, you know, the, the least developed form of the whatever. So India, along with a few other countries, very few other countries, actually went into the reforms in a way that actually made India emerge as a global. Uh, global. And these reforms are very heterodox. Even Joseph Stiglitz has said that don't extrapolate from whatever I have to say about the Indian reforms. No. 
for the left can have a debate on this and I'm not saying that everything that happened in the reform was right. But I know, for example, that uh, on my dissertation committee was Professor Jagdish Mangoti and he told me that, you know, Manmohan Singh, who's actually a neoliberal in the, in the, in the Delhi camp, would argue against certain things that the IMF wanted. Like uh, you know, you know, killing trade unions, and, and he argued that you know we're a democracy, we don't have. So there was, of course, political pressures to keep certain things going that India could never renege on, like agricultural subsidies and things like that. But there was also somewhat of a social democratic inclination among the new liberals, hmm. and of course there was a transition from a social democratic imagination to a new liberal imagination. All of these things were happening within the state. And then, you know, when you see the 90s, mm. then you, uh, you know, people like Arjun Sengupta who were here started actually writing how poverty was not becoming any less. So even for new like Mr. Montek Singh Aluwalia, who would sit in the planning commission with Abhijit Sen and others, there was a lot of thinking about, you know, what, what, what on earth is happening. Was, the economics is not a perfect science. Mm. You know, obviously the trickle-down theory was far more prominent uh, before they began to figure out that trickle down was not working. So even before the Congress party came to power, neoliberals actually started writing about it. And then, of course, my view is, and again, a lot of research needs to be done, you know, the material on how the rights-based approach came about there. We have not looked at it very closely. tell us is that there was a huge debate between liberal and social democrats and the leftists, which somewhat reflected in the National Council. So, for example, in that camp, the Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, was certainly on the new liberal side. Uh, there were others, the President of the National Advisory Council, which is Sonia Gandhi, was probably much more on the social democratic. And these were like two power centers. So I'm just saying that there is a lot of ideation within the state that actually brings the local attention an understanding, of course, in consonance with social movements. But as this is a kind of centralized phenomena, uh, you know, any act that you have at the central level has to be, you know, delivered by the states. And then I think uh, and that's why I was personally very convinced that we have to look uh, policy paradigm in that state, city, the state, at the state level. And then, of course, I would agree with Yamini that you know, when you have social movements, because, you know, NGOs you can work with, but uh, I don't know whether Yamini would disagree with me, that the state played a very important role. For example, they created a social audit office. Now, I call the social audit office in Andhra Pradesh as bringing the society in one of my because social audit office, so we have them who actually in cases by Aruna Roy and she was a product of the Institute of Social Sciences, but she was a servant uh, who was the social secretary of the who was looking at these social experiments. Then, of course, I'm sure there are couples between the regular IAS and, you know, outsiders who get into And then you find that a person with an activist institution actually creates a very, very If you take the powering and puzzling approach to the state level, uh, you will find a lot of divergence. And that is why I think the, uh, the, the West Bengal story is very, very important because it's very counterintuitive but true that from the even from the 1980s and especially between 91 and 94, which is the time when West Bengal came out with an industrial policy resolution, there was a huge neoliberal inclination within the state run by the party, which actually was trying to pressure the central government to have a more hardened stance on the common. So it's a, it's a paradox. At the central level, where they don't have to implement it, they are telling Mrs. Gandhi that, you know, you are too soft. Mm -hmm. 
But when it comes to implement on the ground, their carders have actually become far more penetrated by elements that uh, were not present when land reforms happened in West Bengal in the 1970s. So when I was presenting, let's say, the West Bengal paper at the Center for Social Studies, uh, Professor Pranab Bardhan asked me the same question that uh, Mr. Shujokanto Mishra asked me. You know, he read my books. I thought he will hate me because I also had a and both of them asked me the same question. But Rahul, you have to understand that globalization had created communist West Bengal. You know, our cards had gotten corrupted. And that's why we couldn't do it. And my answer to both to Professor Parker and to Shri is exactly the same. That is, in how do you uh, implementation in Andhra Pradesh? There is much greater penetration of domestic capital, there is much greater penetration of local capital. And yet, and they don't have a dispute in Carter based party. And in fact, in the case of Andhra Pradesh, they even did not give panchayats the kind of role that you would expect in many other states, because through the through the vehicle of something called the field assistance, uh, the, the seminal role was actually played by a lower level bureaucrat who would then get things approved. To the panchayat and the money was transferred directly to the worker, not to the panchayat. And all those mechanisms were developed. So I am arguing uh, to bring the state back in. And the reason for that is that the state gets caught between two schools. Uh, sometimes, because you bring in the state, people think that you are very conservative. But the left also needs the state because otherwise, you know, they don't know how to deal with corporate interests, right? I'm not saying that the state is everything. But what I'm saying is that for a social democratic propensity to uh, get, uh, and in India, we have a federal structure. I think the federal level, but this is not, but this is just to highlight the fact that the entire on the seminal book, particularly on state and poverty in India, there is very little, uh, and Kohli, you know, makes that book look more like a class-based argument, uh, where he's talking about these states with different levels of land reforms, but he cannot actually uh, escape from the idea. So, you know, he, it's, it's like, you know, communist West Bengal has a proper class orientation, uh, Congress, uh, Devrajar's led Karnataka has a middling class orientation and UP doesn't have a class orientation, right? This is his argument hmm. in arguing that, you know, why did land reforms get in making that argument, he has to talk about the coherent ideology. That coherent ideology is the CPM's coherent, coherent and that is what captured the state. Hmm. So I, I think we need a lot more research uh, uh, to right. understand those social forces come together. Uh, in fact, I mean, my the, the shortcoming of the research that I and my colleagues have done is that we have, in that research, piece of research, I think we have focused more on the state. But I think in some ways that is not a bad thing because most people are not willing to look at the state. So sorry, I gave a very long one. No, no, that's okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Yamini, two quick questions and largely drawing from uh, both of your conversation. One is, in some ways, what you both are saying that we got a centralized welfare uh, state and there is a relationship between the party in power and the social movements perhaps it's associated with or aligned with, right? And so, uh, and, and in the 2000s, 2004 to 14 period, when you have uh, uh, Congress the government in power, there is a flurry of welfare schemes that are announced and some don't, uh, but that's another thing. In 2014, we get another uh, power, and, and by 2017, 2018, it seems like this party has uh, sort of where it's also winning uh, at uh, state level, especially state level, was not. What I'm trying to ask you, uh, and, and perhaps uh, which is uh, BJP is also aligned with certain kinds of uh, social movements on the ground, right? Uh, the RSS, RSS affiliated organizations. And if I take uh, uh, Rahul Mukherjee's point about 
ideations being very, very thin in this reconstruction. What kind of welfare state we have? Uh, in your opinion, what is the nature of welfare state at the moment? How it is different from the UPA regime? And are do we have any idea of this idea? ideation story like is it are some ideas drawing the current nature of welfare state or is just basically a much more centralizing tendency uh which is making things different okay and i know i'm not sure whether my question made sense you want me to answer all of that in five minutes <laughs> <laughs> <What about you? laughs> but I, th I think that there's lots of things here and and, and a lot uh in what uh, rahul said as well that are worth unpacking um I think that, uh, you know, you're absolutely right, Rahul, that ideation or, I, or the generation of ideas to build consensus um, across different stakeholders uh, is at the heart of, uh, you know, key structural uh, shifts that uh, political and economic structural shifts that take place. And, in, and, and we all know, we've been looking at the history of CPR as one of many other institutions that played an extremely important role in building that ideation ecosystem um, and generating a new way of thinking. And that new way of thinking builds actually from global trends. There's, there, there's, a, there's a fair amount of exchange uh, that takes place. Um, and I actually think that whilst in that immediate post, uh, at the heart of this, uh, for, you know, at least in the Indian discourse, the question of the state and how it was understood, imagined, uh, and approached by the Indian elite played a very central role also in what later emerges into the narrative of, of the welfare state from the UPA years all the way to the present. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, coming off of license Raj, uh, import substitution, excessive plan, excessive state intervention, and in an environment where industrial policy more generally was becoming across the globe uh, uh, less and less, uh, more and more reviled and less and less appreciated. Um, you saw a, I mean, the zeitgeist at the time was get the state out of the way. And that was, that. that is the whole framework of a free market economy, that is the whole framework of globalization, that is the whole framework in which um, the Indian elite also approached this question. They genuinely were, and not for very good, and for very good reasons, uh, genuinely convinced that uh, excessive state is a problem. And in fact, we need to we need to rid the state. And it's no accident that Gurcharan Das's quip of India goes at night when the state sleeps actually attracts att uh, attention. It, it it kind of really captures the feeling of the moment. And while in the early 1990s, I mean, let's not forget that this structural adjustment program brought with it um, a big push on basic public goods investments. So, you know, there was a sort of very, like all public discourse, you, you, you look to, to polarize things. And so there was a neoliberal versus the left, uh, when in fact the neoliberal, the biggest investments that took place are in one of the sectors that I have traced, education, for instance, it are real push towards universalizing of education and elementary education, including building of schools, hiring teachers, new schemes, new money, all comes as part and parcel of the, the, the famous structural adjustment package um, with, in fact, while uh, the Indian government had slowly begun to make some moves with the new education policy in the late 1980s. It is the global push to universalize elementary education and loans that were beginning to come from the structural adjustment programs through the World Bank into India that made that first big push in the 1990s that resulted in something called the district primary education program, the DPEP, which became the base for many things. So, um, so it's not like the state was going away um, in that sense. So I think, uh, you know, I India's 1991 moment did have these elements of what are core uh, responsibilities of the state in ways better articulated perhaps now than even in the immediate future. But what was missing was an imagination of what the state can actually do and how to build its capacity to deliver on these core functions. There was such a celebration of the exit of the state. There was also such a big polarization of the discourse that it became very difficult to find common ground. And that opened up the opportunity not to actually ideate about these things. 
it is it is it we cannot allow the indian elite to get away who all of whom were part and parcel of building that consensus on the 1991 reform movement to get away from oh we tried to do a little bit of health and education and we did some universalization but it all didn't work out the way it did because as some of those who were part of the 1991 movement when i've asked these questions will say it's very complicated of course it's complicated getting elite consensus is much easier so ashu varshne has this nice you know the sort of distinction he makes between elite politics and mass politics when you start getting into welfare you are actually in the realm of mass politics and in the realm of mass politics there are multiplicities of social forces our democracy also evolves in the in this really intriguing way where the politics of uh, dignity and socio uh, socioeconomic rights actually in some ways starts becoming uh, sitting in tension with each other you would imagine that mass mobilization democracy creating space for marginalized communities to enter into the democratic political mainstream would open up a new politics of socioeconomic rights in fact it opens up a politics of access to state power that is in some ways much more discriminating of socioeconomic rights so the up and bihar of the 1990s and 2000s is a story of dignity for some but no socioeconomic rights for all therefore dignity for some and certainly not dignity for all even though the dignity for some was of those populations who actually uh, uh, fought mobilized and fought very hard to access the power of state to receive that well that that, that dignity so so that's the kind of tension in which the whole story of welfare the relationship between the state and society kind of evolves so we are so it's a elite that recognizes it needs to make these investments and therefore opens up space does not want to ideate or put its money in there in the hope that somebody else will solve the problem because it doesn't have the tools of mass politics uh, I understand the tool of mass politics or be willing to spend time thinking about it it had other priorities a state at the grassroots level that is completely atrophied but the beauty of democracy is that no politics can ignore what signals they are receiving from voters so in fact i think the real turning point was that the india shining story and however whatever realities of political calculations led to the transformation led to that shift of uh, the nda losing and the upa coming in in 2004 the political narrative that was built around india shining was not quite the way it was the, the reality and uh, inclusive growth was to be the new mantra opened up a space then for frankly elite social movements to place their own pressures onto the system and and engage in this dialogue between that that rahul was talking about um but underlying all of this is the reality of an atrophying state which brings me to the present and i'll stop there uh, in a in a minute rahul which is while rahul varma or rahul mukherjee which is while the while in that phase we were in the process of building up this rights based legislation um and and to me some of the most important the most important uh, aspect of that rights based resolution uh, um, uh, effort was that it placed an aspiration uh on the state the aspiration of universal rights badly implemented no doubt and i found myself arguing at the time uh both with myself and intellectually what 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 purpose do rights serve if they cannot actually be enforced and those are very big and difficult questions to answer but in a democratic society where it has been a, where these critical claims of citizenship were yet to articulate themselves that framework of rights and that aspiration of rights has a very very important meaning of what kind of citizenship we should aspire toward and i don't think that we can in any way uh, take away from uh, that that vision or that or the or the broader ideological ideology that frames it but we were not making investments in the state we still remained while we did a little bit uh, in a few state governments where capacity was a little bit better where opportunities opened up you got these islands of excellence but in no way did they translate into a uh, a, a big shift in actually investing in the state and make an in, and building its capability to actually deliver um which is sort of which is where you know the bringing the state back in was so important but it didn't find its front find itself front and center in the discourse in fact i would argue at that point there was a still uh, keep the state out of the economy as much as you possibly can and social movements who recognize the centrality of the state but were fighting the state in in its own way without really thinking very hard about the architecture of the state and that was the missed opportunity 
and into that vacuum comes the, this magic of technology it just emerges emerges with a complete consensus across the board every from mass volume from the masses to the elites from the politicians to the bureaucrats this is the one thing we can all agree on india's digital public infrastructure story is not something that happened by accident it happened on account of the fact that there was complete consensus that we need to do this and we can figure it out we'll do it so it's a difficult thing to do we still managed to do it um, and we did it because the, the, the legitimacy for mass politics to embrace this to a degree comes from the fact that actually the state is not being able to deliver on the ground. So we come to this present moment where technology allows you to say I'm bypassing the local state as much as possible. From the point of view of the larger democratic question, this raises very important concerns. There are trade-offs between bypassing the state and accountability, the trade-offs of efficiency that technology at least has a promise of, whether it does or not is a second question, uh, with uh, accountability because technology by definition is centralizing. And more importantly, in all of this, that aspiration of active claim-making citizenship sort of disappears and opens up the space for a political culture that is also evolving, a political culture that is extremely dependent on more, best exemplified by the BJP, but very visible in regional parties too, exemplified by, by centralized charismatic party leadership that seeks to build this emotive connect with the voter, where welfare becomes a tool. Welfare has always been a critical tool. Uh, in this instant, that connect with the voter is not built on an ideology of rights or an ideology of social justice. It is built on a direct relationship of an emotional connect between the centralized leadership and the individual voter. And it allows the legitimization of this new category of voter mobilization, the labharti, the beneficiary, that isn't a, a, a citizen that claims rights, but a beneficiary of the largesse of the centralized leader. So I feel like we've kind of now in a much wealthier and relatively more, uh, I guess, techno savvy, I don't know if it's efficient state, a state that can reach many more people. So the scale of delivery is more than it was in the 70s, gone circle back to a new version of the Mai Bap Sarkar, one that we need to try and understand because it has greater, very deep implications on our discourse on citizenship and our relationship and, and the and the tactile relationship that is, that is expected to exist between voter and the state and in this the biggest uh, challenge uh, it lies in the fact that the local state now no longer actually plays a role it played the role of enabling and facilitating the patronage of you now that patronage is not necessary through the local state because it can be managed directly but it essentially means that the local state is far is more or less visible or less powerful and again from the point of view of democratic accountability is that a good thing it's an open question from a normative perspective i think it's a very dangerous thing but from an empirical perspective i don't know because it's still unfolding and we have to make sense of how all of this is getting implemented on the ground for which we need data which you know remains uh rahul will do a survey yes <laughs> but no thank you Yami. i think like uh what you are trying to say, if I understand correctly, is that on one hand, there could be arguments because of this centralization, uh, cutting of the middle tier, whether of the state or of local party workers, perhaps there is much more uh, efficient delivery uh, of goods. We don't know, mm -hmm. but, but one can assume maybe there is a sort of like better delivery. But what you are also signaling that citizens might be able to hold these local states or local uh, uh, bureaucrats of, uh, connected with local state or local politicians accountable right but how do you hold accountable to the top tier you don't have any connections what you're saying going future this may create uh, uh, lots of problems with that uh, uh, let me ask people in the room to, uh, to uh, you know ask questions keep your questions brief and also those who have joined us on zoom they can send their questions on q a or that box and they'll come to me so let me take three or four questions and uh, uh yes please uh, can we have no no let, let her ask and then we'll come to you. uh mike am i audible yes oh uh, Pardon me for bad throat. Um, 
Thank you so much for this insightful discussion. Um, a few months back, there was a, a petition in the Supreme Court which said the uh, Election Commission should ban or sort of stop political parties from mentioning free services as a manifesto promise. Now, that is the legal argument. And the court said that uh, we don't have a clear-cut definition of a freebie. So that's a legal argument. My question is, coming to the political reality and the political argument, um, political parties left, right, and center are promising freebies. Uh, so are we reimagining welfareism through the lens of freebies? Because political parties are also seeing electoral benefits, recent examples being Delhi, Himachal, and Karnataka. Or is, is it just a phase because we have sort of enormous levels of inflation and unemployment? So the society or the voter is largely perceptive and receptive towards taking it. Uh, so mine was a similar question. Uh, yeah, so like, I just want you to know that voting and welfare delivery, they are interconnected. And we did talk about, you did mention about how voters are being impacted and welfare delivery does have its uh, variations, like be it service-based, targeted freebies. How has this impacted voting in the last 20 years? And like, you did talk about technology coming in, but what before, what was like before that? How did voters actually respond to welfare delivery? In fact, all political parties promise that, but how did voting impact? Anyone this side? Sir, my question is to Yamini, ma'am. Uh, in UPA 1 and UPA 2, there were several uh, several various welfare programs like Manrega to National Food Security Act till 2014. But neither National Advisory Council or the government has not created a separate uh, vote bank that is Labharti in terms of NDA. So what was the problem? Either it is also problem in policy or politics. Anyone else decide and uh, I have a question for both of the uh, speakers. Uh, sir, ma'am, uh, I would like to know, I mean, in this post-industrialized uh, world, how much welfare state uh, term you know is relevant and uh, rather than being a welfare state uh, can our country or the government uh, go for uh, how we can empower people towards uh, uh, getting the social uh, upward mobility uh, yeah. So voting and welfare delivery, you know, I, uh, I would confess like Yamini that I have, uh, you know, I can give you intuitive answers and I can give you a theoretical answer. So service delivery is state capacity, right? We know that the land reforms in West Bengal kept the communists in power for whatever, 35 years. Uh, we know that uh, Mr. Rajshikar Reddy was invincible in Andhra Pradesh for, for a long time. Uh, but despite these things, you know, Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, Jharkhand have high levels of poverty and inability to, you know, deliver, you know, the basically circumventing the clientelistic propensities. So in a way, I am not averse to the idea that be it the communists or be it the BJP or be it the Congress, if you can, let's say, provide what are called citizenship rights uh, in a citizen-oriented manner, I don't have a problem with that. But I would have a problem, for example, if you bypass the conventions of uh, election management. And, you know, after the elections are uh, announced, you go and make specific appeals. And then if you say that, you know, after making these specific appeals, if we win, then, you know, you will get even more during the Holi celebration. Uh, 
so those kinds of those kinds of appeals, I think, should be checked by the election commission. Uh, I would also argue that citizenship oriented service delivery should uh, be in the name of the state and not in the name of an individual. I mean, the state, of course, an individual and a party, you know, if you, if you can give service delivery, you, you will get voted back to power. And in many ways, I think it is not a bad thing at all. Uh, I was recently delivering a lecture in Dibrugar, and one of the persons said that, you know, different parties are competing, right? So there are these five things that in Karnataka they've been offered. And uh, so the question that came up was that at the end of the day, if we keep giving everybody everything, then where will farmers have the incentive to come and work in the fields, right? This is one way of asking the question. The other way of asking the question is that, uh, is that you know these are like these are not good incentives for people to work right one is that is a productivity question then there is an incentives kind of question my own understanding in the field is that when you kind of transcend clientelistic propensities and you actually reach out to the poor it doesn't happen perfectly i mean in fact the, if i if i did Good villages in Andhra Pradesh, I did equally bad villages in Andhra Pradesh. And if somebody looked at my qualitative empirical story, they would come to the conclusion that Andhra Pradesh was not very successful. Uh, but what surprised me was that I selected the good villages and the bad villages from the data supplied by the, uh, the social audit office. And I went to those villages without telling anyone in the government that I was going to the state. And I found that the social audit office actually knew which were the good villages and which were the bad villages. And then surprisingly, the director of the social audit office sometimes even knew about the politics of that village. Now that for me is state capacity. Now, you know, you will have those good and bad villages everywhere, right? So my learning from this experience was that, you know, we have to change our evangelization of thinking about poverty. Because we are living in such a poor country with so many people, you know, at sub saharan levels of poverty. I mean, this is not acceptable anywhere in the world. Even in the relatively poorer, you know, relatively poorer, but in terms of welfare, much superior countries than ours. And I think we have to get out of this mindset that making people work to get something or uh, providing some basic necessities like nutrition or education. Uh, if it actually goes to the people who are needy, I'm not saying, I mean, you will find that people have died and somebody else is, uh, you know, getting it. In, in. I think, I think if it, if it really hits the BPL level, where the levels of are acceptable, uh, I don't think that the globalized world can solve that problem. And that is why I talk about the policy paradigms approach. You know, even within the government of India, even within the different states, there are different policy paradigms. And one paradigm is that, you know, growth will trickle down to the poor. That was Mr. Modi's paradigm when he came and he thought that, you know, all this Jholawala economics will not work. But today, uh, you know, even this government has to depend on freebies and what you, right? So I am not saying that that is the final resting place for the for the economy, but this is something that every country does. I mean, even Germany does. In Germany, you lose your employment. The state will give you employment. I mean, you'll give you almost your salary for uh, for a year or something like that. So it is not like you know only citizens in a poor country deserve this. Citizens in very well-to-do countries where there is public education and public health. Uh, given at a very high level of quality, actually provide that kind of welfare. And nobody says that it is uh, peanuts or that it is taking away from the incentives for people to work. So my view is that certainly uh, I am not arguing against the importance of incentives. I mean that the MGNREGS that we began to fund from 2008 onwards 
at one percentage point of GDP was 40,000 crores. But 40,000 crores or eight or nine billion US was just one percentage point of our GDP. Why? Because the economy had grown. But your imagination has to be that growth is inadequate and that the state has to intervene to redistribute that growth. And that will even be in the interest of capital. It will not be, it will be in the long-term interest of capital, but that's not the reason why you do it. The reason why you do it is because that growth is ultimately support, is ultimately supposed to produce a citizen. And that citizen should not go malnourished, that citizen should have, so when you find people who are from the absolutely lowest social and economic class, sending their girl child to school, giving them non-vegetarian meat protein, mm. Uh, in the villages, you really see that, you know, a program has succeeded. And oftentimes, you see, many of these people have self-respect. They don't want to take things for you for free. There are people you will meet. They will say that, no, we won't take the money from you. We will do some work. And, and, and so I think we have to get out of this mindset in an absolutely poor country of the idea that some people just don't deserve anything. But on the other hand, uh, we also have to fight, fight clientelism. And we also have to see that these amenities are provided for citizenship formation rather than to promote a certain party or a certain ideology at the expense of other. And that is where I think you require a lot of regulation of how all of these things are done through the election commission and other things. Yamin, do you want to add to respond to any particular question? Well, I mean, I think that uh, Rahul has uh, sort of done a really fantastic job of answering most, most of the questions. So I don't know. Um, I, maybe two, two, three quick uh, things. I think um, the, this question of freebie, freebies versus whatever else uh, is partly of, you know, little, uh, to my mind, a bit of a political eyewash in the sense that. Um, the real question is what kind of economy do you have and what are the needs of your citizens? And if the, the nature of public investment has to be debated within that context. And part of the reason why uh, we are, you know, uh, investment, so first investment in human capital is an essential component of what makes for any country's growth trajectory. And we have enough data from across the world to know that. So just from a pure economic growth point of view, just as you need to invest in physical infrastructure, you need to have roads, highways, ports, logistics, all in all in tune to be able to create an enabling environment for an economy to grow. So do you need good health and good education? A vast proportion of people, uh, as they are emerging out of poverty, find themselves in that middle layer. The World Bank refers to it as a vulnerable population. That vulnerable population are one income shock away from poverty in order for them to be able to take any kind of financial risk for which there will be long-term gain, they need to have a basic social security flow. No country in the world has been able to grow its economy without investing in that social, in that basic flow. To give you a perspective of where India stands, 50% of India's poor, this is now dating back to data uh, that is so long gone that we that perhaps the number is even more complicated now sit within that vulnerable uh, category. One income shop means that if one member of working member of that family falls ill and they have to go to hospital in a place where the bulk of healthcare now has to be privatized because of poor quality health infrastructure, they basically fall back into poverty. So there is no question about any growth occurring, even though this constant positioning of growth versus welfare as trade-offs is, is presented to us uh, in the political discourse without actually investing in people, investing in labor. That is how economies grow. So to me, it's just a basic expectation. The larger question, I think, for India is also, what is the kind of economic imagination that we are bringing to the table? Why is it that we are not asking the question about how much government subsidies is going to PLIs and how many jobs are those PLIs creating? But we will talk about whether that if we are giving some kind of electricity subsidy or we are uh, uh, introducing uh, free transportation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All of those investments have equal amounts, if not more, multiplier effects. Is that we do not measure them and we do not bring them into the context of our conversation, and we have rested in peace with this idea that 
anything that is good for politics is actually really bad for the economy and it's just a freebie. It's a, it, I find it a derogatory term uh, in a democracy and one that we should actually eliminate from public discourse, but it's there for all of us. To the, um, the second question on um, you know, Narega NFSA versus vote banks, there's many things embedded there, but I just throw one piece of, so I don't know that we have any definitive data and Rahul, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that tells us there is in fact a direct link between benefits received or schemes received and voter voting patterns. I don't know that we have anything that is definitive on this. Clearly, it creates a certain amount of political legitimacy, which is why politicians invest in it. That, to my mind, is an excellent thing. I think it's really good that political parties are competing about Delhi models and Gujarat models and Dravidian models. That is, that's the core of what a democracy should be debating and engaging with. But the one shift that we do see, which I think is quite interesting, is linked to this federal dynamic. Even as we most of our investments in welfare, we've had this tension. Much of the innovation has happened when state politics creates the opportunity to invest in welfare. Midday meals, meals is a classic example. Another really interesting example is from Bihar in the uh, early years of the Nitish Kumar government that gave cycles to girls to go to secondary schools. And now all over the country, whether they're going to school or not, I don't know. But the biggest change I've seen are girls in school uniforms, all teenagers on their bicycles going somewhere. And that uh, that has been a huge uh, sort of national pro program that comes out. So, so the employment guarantee in Maharashtra resulted in created the, uh, the 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 pilot, so to speak, for the national employment guarantee, so on and so forth. But what the electoral data, what voting data does tell us, so the CSDS surveys, is that so, uh, is that while there was a lot of this state innovation centrally sponsored schemes and an expansion of investments from the national government into social sector programs uh, created a new kind of tension because while the money was coming from the center, the implementation was always to be undertaken by the state establishment and good chief ministers or chief ministers that were seeking electoral legitimacy would take on these schemes and kind of hone them and implement them well. So Rajasthan actually under the BJP government in the early days of NREJ had a far better record of implementing NREJ than when a Congress government came in some years later. So there was always this healthy tension and it showed up in voter data. How? That these national schemes in state election, in, in national elections, the attribution for good implementation and to a degree, a good implementation would always go to the chief minister. And bad implementation, chief ministers were quite deft about handing it back to government of India. The government of India didn't release the money we couldn't implement. Mm -hmm. The big shift that has taken place now, which you see in the 2019 voter data, is that you see for some of the key national schemes that are uh, attributed, that, that there are these Pradhan Mantri schemes of different kinds, the voter attribution is directly to the government of India and specifically the prime minister. So to the extent that it, it, the, this sort of emotive connection is working, I think that we have some data to suggest that it is, how long it lasts and whether that translates into voter behavior or vote bank politics of a new kind is an open question. Uh, so let me take two questions. Uh, uh, I've only got two, three questions from Zoom. Those who have questions, please do send it on Q&A box. Uh, one is, how do you assess the relative role of activist mass politics versus vis-a-vis -vis mass politics? channeled through electoral politics in advancing the welfare state in UPA 1 and 2, and then Modi 1 and 2. Would it be accurate to argue that emergence of civil society as a vocal interest group has undermined the role of liberal parties in electoral politics? Then there are some questions related to welfare and GVs that you have already answered. Then there's a question on uh, sort of like being spec, not speculative, but uh, a future, uh, uh, like after 2024, who knows? But one question is, why do you think the BJP does not enact right-based social rights legislation? Uh, right-based legislations. Uh, Any one of you can mm -hmm. you start. Well, uh, uh, two reasons. I think ideologically, uh, the imagination of citizenship is quite different and the push uh, to a uh, towards duties is much more visible in the articulation of uh, the citizen state relationship in, in the ideology uh, of the BJP than it has in the past, which is not to say that the Congress or any other political party was necessarily actively about rights. Of course, social justice and politics of dignity of the uh, of the, of the uh, of you of the 1990s of UP and Bihar was certainly about uh, about some rights. 
um, but, uh, but, but there was more space for an articulation of socioeconomic rights, at least as it was evolving uh, in the, um, uh, in the post-2004 phase, for which I do think that the social movement's imagination played a really important role. In a sense, the ideation for 1991 and economic reforms that was taking place in buildings like this, uh, the ideation for rights-based uh, which then eventually converted into policy, the ideation for rights-based welfare was happening through social movements, which then found an opportunity to embed itself in policy through the NAC, and then these laws uh, uh, the, these laws emerged. But also, I think the BJP, when it came into power in 2014, had itself a little bit of a challenge, which is that uh, while it recognized, because even though the campaign in 2014 was very much about minimum governance, maximum government, minimum government, maximum governance, um, and and uh, positioning its uh, uh, the, the BJP as a market reformer that would finish the task that uh, was set out in 1991, which UPA failed to do, state BJP parties were very much uh, rec recognized the relevance and significance of. Uh, welfare investments. They, that is why, I mean, think about Chhattisgarh, which had one of the longest standing BJP chief ministers, uh, is credited for being one of the pioneers of PDS reform that provided the base on which the National Food Security Act um, was actually uh, designed um, for PDS reform. So it's not like the BJP ever abandoned the idea of, uh, or, um, uh, of welfare. It's that it, the challenge it had is that if it positions itself like that, it doesn't be, it won't be able to distinguish itself from uh, uh, from the UPA. And it also explored with explore was exploring a very different understanding, imagination of what welfare is supposed to be, of what empowerment is. You can see that particularly in the early years when the Prime Minister took over, when, when Prime Minister Modi, uh, when candidate Modi became Prime Minister Modi, and in his early speeches. The articulation was very much about uh, creating a broad-based safety net um, of, of the kind that uh, you know, would ensure a certain type of social insurance, but not, and, and that would sort of, you know, so it was about poverty, uh, 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 pov poverty elimination, not poverty alleviation. I forget the exact phraseology that was used. Uh, but the idea really was that we are going to give certain kinds of investments that would give or uh, that would build a foundation and then people have to be able to uh, kind of uh, leverage those uh, to be able to uh, to play in the market better. So it was a very neoliberal imagination, I think, of welfare. Um, and to be able to promote that, it positioned its own welfare in kind of as a, uh, in this what I think is a false dichotomy of rights versus in, uh, empowerment or entitlements versus empowerment, arguing that the rights-based welfare of the UPA was all about entitlements to citizens, whereas the new welfare architecture that was being built out is about empowerment. Uh, it's about specific things that people need, how homes, toilets, gas, etc., that would empower citizens to become active players in the market. So that's the kind of distinction it was it, it was trying to make. Um, and I think it continues to try and articulate that, although in effect, if you look at actual overall investment, partly because of COVID, but the big investment was made in the National Food Security Act. Mm -hmm. But even here, the, the actual implementation was never, uh, was never done within using the language of rights or the grammar of rights. It was very much in the grammar of Labharti of benefits that were being given uh, in this very direct, uh, emotive way directly from the Prime Minister. A uh, couple of questions from the room and then we'll close. Anyone this side? I'll... Okay. Partha, I'll give you a chance. Uh, uh, Rahul, just uh, the uh, I'm just wondering uh, whether in the context in which we are, so two kinds of things, right? One is if these kinds, certain kinds of initiatives, especially cash transfers of a variety, DBTs of a variety of sorts, have to become now so normalized that regardless of who wins, the voter expects to receive it and therefore it ceases to be a differentiating uh, aspect in politics, right? So, for example, today, I don't think anybody would think um, that PDS could go away, though what we saw in Karnataka was interesting, that because 
the government was unable to implement the PDS, they sort of substituted it with the cash transfers too. So one part is to sort of try and understand what is now completely normalized. That uh, it's like social security in the US that you would, no party would sort of walk away from it. And therefore it ceases to be something of political uh, interest in some sense, right? And the second is a bit more tricky, which is the way one thinks of, there's been a lot of talk about rights. And there is the whole story of the Labharti. Mm. And I'm just trying to think about if you could sort of talk us through the kind of political party structures and the nature of welfare delivery. So, for example, if I have a situation where the political power and everything needs to emanate from a central source. And in that sense, everybody is supposed to get benefits from someone who is essentially responsible for providing these benefits to you. Does that translate more to a Labharti beneficiary kind of discourse? Whereas a rights discourse is something that a citizen claims without somebody having to sort of give it to you. This, and Artha, which West. therefore becomes a more central, non-central kind of thing. So is, is that something that is an issue at this point? I think Sparta has taken time to speak with. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, so, so basically, I think, uh, I think if you read uh, Hugh Heckler's famous book on how the welfare state got embedded in, uh, uh, in Europe, uh, then you will find that uh, no matter whether right-wing or left-wing governments came to power, uh, there was a steady focus. I mean, this is this is actually the place from where puzzling came. I mean, Hugh Hecklow, apart from Peter Hall, is really one of the foundational ideationalists of this understanding of policy puzzling. So they, they said that, you know, these bureaucrats actually worked with right-wing and left-wing governments. Obviously, there were political advantages. Uh, towards an understanding of the welfare state. It happened gradually, it happened over time. And in a, in a way, I think what you're saying, I mean, we haven't, we haven't done that kind of thorough work to see how policy processes actually get embedded and normalized. Initially, uh, when N.T. Ramarao was giving freebies, everybody thought that he was a populist. But today, economists know that you know N.T. Ramarao's targeting was one of the best. And uh, but you know the common middle class perception was that N.T. Ramarao, M.G. Ramachandran. I mean, if you were talking about these people in the 1970s, everybody in the middle class thought that you know these are like uh, politicians who are you know cinema stars and they don't know anything. Now that has become normalized. Now people say that you know Tamil Nadu is a state that attracts. A lot of foreign direct investment. Tamil Nadu also, you know, gives laptop computers. Uh, I think I think Karnataka is now giving not cycles but scooters. But the point the point I'm trying to make is that that this normalization is important, but the normalization should be properly targeted, right? This is also very very important because we don't. I mean, if, if there are scarce resources that are going for the normalization of things that will add to human capital. And uh, I agree with Sen over here that it's not a means and ends question. It's also a question of the quality of life, human dignity and all that. Uh, but on the second question of rights and labharti, uh, I agree with you that, you know, I don't think that a citizen of India should feel beholden to any government or to any person for receiving a right. So when you move from the rights discourse to a discourse where you're being made to believe that you know, there is this benevolent uh, source of power, which is pro providing something that you should actually get mm. as your right, there I think is a real problem. And, 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 and I, do, I, I mean, you could actually use such instruments to 
produce all kinds of regimes. Uh, and, uh, and, then, and those regimes don't believe in rights at all. I mean, there, there are regimes. Uh, I was in China for two weeks in the month of May. Uh, uh, there are no rights. I mean, I did, I did meet a lot of people, senior scholars uh, who were extremely critical. I found people more critical in Shanghai than I've ever found in Singapore, where I taught for eight years. But, but they still can't uh, you know, have a discourse within the context of rights. They can, be, uh, they can be very, very unhappy about what Xi Jinping is doing. But, but they don't have, they, they can't claim uh, a manner in which they can actually say that COVID management was bad. Or they can say that, you know, young people are not getting married because uh, of uh, real estate costs, because of uh, education costs, and, uh, and all of the things that are essential for uh, getting a family going. Uh, so I would really, really worry. I mean, that's a very important question that you that you know you can be doing the same thing, but from a different philosophical standpoint. I am not comfortable at all if it is not from the standpoint of rights. I don't know whether that answers your question. After COVID nineteen, there are social and welfare. Both are I'm segregating them both. Uh, the social and welfare. There is a question rises on ideology, political, and moral. There are the three factors. According to these three factors, uh, what are the measures uh, parties and uh, uh, states should take to achieve that level, structural transformative level that you said earlier mentioned? Uh, how do we should uh, parties should achieve that level? That question is... As according to ideology, moral, and politics. Let's speak one more question. I would prefer one sort of like female asking a question because we had this one. Anyone of you want to ask a question? Hello, this is the last question and then we'll... Hello, Yamini ma'am. As you mentioned that as you mentioned that there have been commissions like the Kothari Commission, which uh, focused on investing in the health and education and expending expenditure in these sections, but there still has been low investment in the local state. Why is it so? Because they are very important for any democracy and from the point of view of any government who is ruling in such a democracy like India, which Sir mentioned is a very poor country in some sorts. Why is the investment so low and why aren't the, why aren't the government focusing on this as a primary investment factor? So let's like, we are in the wrap up mode now. So whoever you wants to, to start. Last one, all right. <laughs> you, since you are a guest, you should have the last word. Um, I, I'll take that. Uh, thanks. That's a very important question. Uh, the question of why uh, in a democracy these critical uh, elements of invest uh, uh, are not actually core to the social contract uh, is a question that many have grappled with and not quite come out with a good answer. But I will say a few things. I, I, I do think that uh, it's not like investments have not been made. Uh, I think that India's uh, uh, actually, if you look at the achievement of near universal uh, school in, uh, in near universal enrollment since 2005, six rural India has had about a 98 point of, uh, percent uh, enrollment ratio in primary schools. That includes girls, even difficult states like Bihar managed to make very, very quick and speedy improvements once it began to invest in getting girls into school. Um, so, so, you know, they have there has been, uh, you know, you can't go to a village in India now without seeing a school that has been built, health centers has been built. So there has been investment of that hard physical infrastructure, which ramped up and accelerated in the late, in the late 90s, early 2000s. I think the challenge always has been about building the capability to actually deliver inside of these. And that is both a matter of uh, financial investment. It's also a matter of state capacity. It's also an element of uh, building accountability. And those are the softer pieces uh, of, of uh, investments where I think the Indian state has failed. It's been much better at being able to build a school, but completely incompetent at, ens at ensuring the teacher can actually teach. And it so happened that this also came parallel to the expansion of the private sector. So in fact, if you look at India's education pre-COVID, 
uh, there was a fairly uh, rapid movement out of the public system into the private system as a consequence of, there were many reasons, but one of those included the fact that the public system just wasn't being able to deliver high quality uh, education. I do think that a lot of this is slowly on the, uh, is slowly changing. I think that, um, uh, you know, I just came back from a workshop with public health specialists in, in Bangalore uh, doing a survey on uh, uh, primary health systems in a, in a wide range of states. And the thing that was really interesting is in that poorer parts of India, where the health system is actually quite invisible, uh, you see a very large uh, trust in the capacity of the health system to actually deliver. Um, and while you know a lot of people who are experts in this field and who've been looking at public health, working in public health for for decades, uh, puzzled over it, one of the uh, answers that came was actually COVID. It played a very very important role because for that period of time, the private system just completely shut down. And in fact, the most visible government, the most visible person in a village was the ASHA worker in the AM. Um, so, so that is so that, that there there are actually emerging shifts that we are beginning to see. I think that the Amadmi Party is a really good example where education and education reforms, really hard reforms around pedagogy, teaching, etc., not just the the glammy stuff like setting up, you know, building schools and hiring teachers. Um, have actually been very much part of what has built the political legitimacy of the Amadmi Party in Delhi. Ultimately, voting patterns may tell you that other things came into play, but the fact that education and health are on the political map and many states across the country are, are now with state, state, regional parties and state parties are actually competing over some of this is, a, is in my mind a relatively healthy sign. But all of this is happening against a backdrop of a moment where without having made those hardcore investments on the ground over decades, you're really dealing with a very hollowed out state. Um, this requires a commitment and a long-term investment, which goes against political incentives of five-year electoral cycles. It requires moving away from a very centralized approach to a much more decentralized one, which goes against the incentive structure of the politics of the day. It involves us thinking about state capacity in a very different way, which means that you actually train and empower local bureaucrats, teachers, panchayats, and not only the I talk about IAS reform as the only thing that, that dominates public discourse. These are the kinds of investments we need. And uh, we, we haven't, I don't think, made enough progress there. Rahul? Yeah, I, I, I'll just say uh, something about COVID because this is a very favorite topic. I published a paper in the Journal of Democracy in, uh, in the October of 2020 where just by looking at COVID management, I uh, could convince the editors that India has become a competitive authoritarian regime. Uh, competitive authoritarian because there are competitive elements which uh, would suggest that India is not authoritarian, but there are authoritarian elements which would suggest that it is not democratic either. And, and this is exactly sort of goes back to the question that Partho just raised. You know, uh, you can look at that paper and there is more uh, detailed analysis of how, how the state failed uh, and did not deliberate. Uh, but you would be surprised that there was not one serious parliamentary deliberation, uh, despite members of the opposition seeking it uh, before the lockdown. I mean, there were some minor discussions on, you know, how much of what can be imported and what else. But there was not one serious parliamentary dis deliberation. And a variety of measures were taken, like, you know, from the Prime Minister's Relief Fund to PM Care, all kinds of decisions were taken without deliberation. So I don't want to belabor this point because we're already at quarter to seven, but it, it, it sort of brings home the point that if you don't have deliberation, and if you don't take citizen concern into account, then you can actually have catastrophes. I mean, you know better than me what happened during the second wave of COVID. And before the second wave, wave of COVID, I, uh, the ICMR had a survey which was not released to the public, where it was very well known that these kinds of things can happen. The government only pre-ordered 350 million uh, sort of... Uh, vaccines, uh, which was a suboptimal order. 
whereas i can tell you the whereas the world was expecting india to become the vaccine capital of the world at least the developing world we were struggling to provide vaccines even for our own people and had already given away uh, 60 million vials uh, in an effort to become a great vishwa guru so so state the point, i also want to make the conceptual point that state capacity has to do with both political will and technical thinking there was an organization called insacob uh, whose chair you know shahib jamil had released a report which was available with mr goba who is the cabinet secretary uh, the prime minister's office cannot say that and you know then mr jamil kind of went away and said that look you guys don't believe in science and ultimately that has taken the lives of our relatives right left and center so state capacity has to do with two things one is uh, not only a good scientific understanding i can tell you that the icmr produced two uh, scientists at icmr produced two journal articles in the indian journal of medical research which had a far more enlightened view about the lockdown and it was never discussed so you know it's not like that's why when harsh mandar and couple of other people went with the first public interest litigation they said that look at least access the technical knowledge available on how to deal with the lockdown but the technical knowledge was completely ignored so you know state capacity has to do i'm sure the present government regrets what happened right <laughs> it would have been far better off uh, if they had actually deliberated on the issue and had consulted the experts because india is not short of experts mm. india is not short of smart people but if you don't have the political will to engage these smart people and of course everybody has the right to life everybody has the right to get an oxygen cylinder is <laughs> mm. forget about nutrition and other things so in fact the covid story is a very tragic lesson in the history of public health in india and i was in germany at that time so i can tell you that a country like germany which didn't boast a bit about its capacity actually had very few deaths but you know those capacities were there i can tell you that they uh, angela merkel had a very very sophisticated team of a commission of sociologists psychologists medicine people who came together and then the robert koch institute was uh, telling the entire country what to do everybody was looking at the website of the robert koch institute but you need to deliberate and you need to uh, put political will behind that deliberation and then of course there is the question of rights people do have the right to life they do have the right to oxygen cylinders and the covid saga is one of those very gory uh, gory sagas in the history of public health in india and this one actually took the lives of rich well endowed middle class and upper middle class people but well, thank you rahul i i think let's take home this point that deliberations are very important in democracy and since we like this series is being run to understand elections and democracy in india let's continue to participate in this series uh, and deliberate and think about how elections and democracy is being in run in india next uh, session is on 16th of august at 5 pm again with ashutosh vashne and partha mukhopadhyay i hope i will see many of you here and those of you can join us on zoom would be great so thank you again rahul and yamini for this lovely conversation and everyone are uh, engaging with us great thank you thank you bye bye thank you